Hi, welcome back to my channel. Today is the first episode of the No Man Knows My History series. We'll be discussing Fawn Brody herself, the preface, and the first chapter. The first question I wanted to talk about is who is Fawn Brody? And why should we care what she has to say about Joseph Smith? Fawn Brody was the niece of David O. McKay, who was a prophet of the LDS Church. Her father was his younger brother, and he also was a general authority, just not as high up. She grew up in the McKay family home that was owned by the entire McKay family in Huntsville, Utah. And David O. McKay, the prophet of the LDS Church, he also grew up in that same home. She called the family's lifestyle genteel poverty because they lived in a really nice house and looked like they probably had a lot of money, but they didn't. Because of her uncle, her paternal side would be what a lot of people refer to as Mormon royalty. However, her mother's side was also considered that. Her maternal grandfather, George Brimhall, was a president of BYU. Fawn herself said that she was very religious and very strong in her faith as she grew up. Her, she was very smart. People would refer to her as precocious. She graduated with a bachelor's from the University of Utah and then went on to the University of Chicago where she got her master's at only 20 years old. And this was pre-1940s. She met and married her husband in Chicago. They married after only a few weeks. Her father did not come to the wedding because her husband was Jewish. When she's spoken about her past, she had said that she never really questioned anything about the LDS Church until she was on a debate trip. I believe it was when she was at the University of Utah. When she went on a debate trip, and her, she was telling her roommate about Joseph Smith's first vision and the gold plates. And her roommate asked her where the gold plates were. Does the church still have them? Are they the, at the headquarters in Salt Lake City? And she said, no, the angel came back and took them back up to heaven. And her friend rolled her eyes and said, really? And that was the first time she realized that to other people, her belief system was very strange. It made her kind of question it of, is that really what happened? That during this trip, she also learned about polygamy for the very first time. She became curious about Joseph Smith and how he translated the Book of Mormon and to know more about the story. And so while she was at the University of Chicago, she ended up getting a job as a night clerk at the library. There she had access to lots of books newspapers, original documents that she didn't have access to before, never even thought to look up. And since she was in Illinois, where Nauvoo was, they had a lot of things about the early Mormons and Joseph Smith. Over the next few years, she and her husband had children, and she always considered being a mom and taking care of her children as her number one job, but she was able to work on this book. During this time, as far as I could tell, this is when she lost her faith while she wrote the book but she also was able to get access to a lot of things other people couldn't have access to because of her uncle. While he did give her access to quite a few things and she was able to go to church headquarters and get into things, she also was told no by Joseph Fielding Smith, the church historian, when she asked for a particular item. We don't know for sure what that item is. She just talked about asking him for something and being told no and that he, was, that he treated her pretty badly and she decided not to ask for it again. There's a lot of speculation about this being Joseph Smith's journal with one of the first vision accounts in it, but we don't know for sure. The Community of Christ, the reorganized church, the descendants of Joseph Smith actually gave her a lot of access to the original documents they had as well. This book was first published in 1945. And at that time, it's pretty remarkable that a woman as young as Fawn Brody was, was able to find so many sources for things in the early church that weren't public knowledge yet. And that's why for so many years, people could say, oh, it's anti-Mormon, because they couldn't really check it themselves unless they went and did the same amount of research. And it's pretty amazing how now I can go back and I can read this, now that the church has more transparency with the Joseph Smith papers and the Gospel Topics essays, we're finding out that these things that she said back then that people were told were lies are true. And yet, she was able to find this information without the church sources. In most cases like this, the LDS church would probably have just ignored it and kind of hoped it went away. But this book was selling so well that they had to respond. They responded in two ways. The first was a pamphlet called The Appraisal of the So-Called Brody Book. That was put out in the church news and later became a pamphlet. The other way they responded was a book by Hugh Nibley called No Ma'am, That's Not History. 
She responded to both of these responses. She said that the pamphlet was at least well-written and clever, a piece of Mormon propaganda. She felt like that the pamphlet at least tried to meet the points that she made logically and to try to respond to them in a way that made sense. Hugh Nibley's book was snarky and she called it a flippant shallow piece. He of course was trying to debunk everything she said and say that it was all lies, but the church now backs her up. And so I find it very interesting how so many people still go to his book if you talk about her book. In fact, I had a family member that when she saw that I had read Fawn Brody's book asked me if I'd be willing to read Hugh Nibley's book. I politely told her, no, I'm not interested. I backed up everything she said in this book by church sources. I don't need to read his, his book. Maybe someday I will, but I don't think so. They held her trial, for lack of a better word, and excommunication in 1946. She was accused of being guilty of teaching false doctrine, specifically of denying the divine nature of Mormonism and the prophetic calling of Joseph Smith. She said that unfortunately her uncle never spoke to her again. And he did speak at the next general conference of the LDS Church, mentioning people like her, and it was pretty obvious that he was talking about her publicly. One question I had when I was researching this, thinking about it, is did the first presidency of the church know at the time that the things that she was writing about were true? Did, had they read the book? Or were they villainizing her? and trying to debunk what she wrote in this book, knowing full well that the things she wrote about were true. That's something we can never know, but I find it very interesting to think about. She became a professor of history at the University of California in LA, and she died in 1981. I am in no way vouching for her character or any of her other books. I am very impressed by a woman in that time period being able to accomplish what she did, not only with the book, but also with her schooling but I really don't know that much about her and her views and if she believed in the same things that I believe in. But the work speaks for itself. I don't have to know about all of her other books and if all of them are completely accurate. I don't have to know if she was a completely wonderful person in every way in her life. All I need to know when I'm reading this book is, is she giving me correct information? And what do I think about this book? So that's what I'm gonna focus on in this series. In the acknowledgments of the book, she cites her sources. I'm going to read those. University of Chicago, the Utah State Historical Society, the Western Reserve Historical Society, the New York Public Library, the New York State Library, and the Library of Congress. The Huntington Library furnished me with microfilm of early letters of Oliver Cowdery. The county clerks at Chardon, Ohio, and Woodstock, Vermont went to much trouble to unearth for me early court records involving Joseph Smith and his father. Dr. Frederick M. Smith, president of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for permission to examine the letters of Emma Smith and other manuscript material in Independence, Missouri. Mr. Alvin Smith at the Latter-day Saints Church Historian's Office in Salt Lake City kindly permitted me to examine several other Mormon periodicals. So that shows how many sources she had, how many places she got information from. In the preface of the book, she states, in official Mormon biographies, he has been made a prophet of greater status than Moses. And I think this is a really important point, even so early in the book. He really is held up to that kind of standard. So many people will hear nothing bad about him. And if they do, they don't believe it. And this speaks to a greater story in the LDS church because the leaders are still held up like that. Once a leader dies, for a few years, people kind of think of them that way still. But right now, the LDS Church is going through a phase where they are kind of discrediting earlier prophets that have said things that the current prophet, Russell M. Nelson, is going against, or things he's changed, including the name of the church. For a while there, they embraced the term Mormon. Millions of dollars were spent on the I Am a Mormon campaign to try to get videos out there of famous people or people that had good stories that were Mormon. They, they really embraced it. When they were prophets, Russell M. Nelson still did not like the nickname Mormon. You can go back and you can see talk when Hinckley was a prophet and when Monson was a prophet where they have a talk about using the name Mormon and it being okay. But then he would get up and give a talk about how it wasn't. One of the first things he did was change the perception of the nickname Mormon again. And now you can go online and if you call people Mormons, you will find that a lot of people get really, really angry and they will tell you that is not what we are called and they will get, they will get very offended. And it, it surprises me sometimes how, how fast people forget that just 10 years ago, they were fine with it. 
and that the prophet was okay with it. Because whoever is the prophet right now is hero worshipped so much that he can do no wrong. People absolutely adore and love Russell M. Nelson. And there are so many instances of him lying, of him doing things that are wrong, that they would get in trouble for if they did as normal members. But they hold him up. And so they are still doing what they were doing to Joseph Smith back then and what people still do with Joseph Smith. Another line that I found important in the preface is, there are few men, however, who have written so much and told so little about themselves. People really don't seem to know that much about Joseph Smith and what he thought and did on a daily occurrence, except for the things that are found in his journals that he wrote decades later. And he always wrote those with an audience in mind. So that made me think about my journals from high school that I look back and I really, really cringe when I read them now. I told my kids a few years ago, I was rereading one of them and I said, oh my gosh, if I could go back and like punch myself through my journal through time, I would. It's really embarrassing, some of the things I wrote and the way I wrote them. But that's because I was just writing out my feelings and writing what happened to me on a daily basis and I wasn't really thinking about who was going to read it. I did think that eventually my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and all that would read them. We are encouraged in the LDS Church to keep journals for our posterity. But I didn't think about it while I was writing it, at least not very often. And so it's really embarrassing. But his journals were written with an audience in mind. And so they only tell us what he wants us to know. Also, if I tried to write those journals of the things I did as a teenager or in my early 20s, and I was writing them now, I wouldn't get everything right. If there was something as important as God visiting me, I think I would remember that and get that right. But most of the other mundane details, I wouldn't because I'm, it's so far away. And yet he was writing his journals decades later. Another thing that he did repeatedly in them was denying polygamy, which we know he did. So it does call into question if you think critically about it, it calls into question everything else he talks about in his journals that happened to him. On to chapter one, the gods are among the people. This chapter gives us an introduction to Joseph Smith, his family, and the things that led up to him starting a church. Joseph Smith was born in Sharon, Vermont on December 23rd, 1805. He was the fourth child of Joseph and Lucy Mack Smith. On the first page, there is a quote from an old New England magazine where they say of Sharon, Vermont, this is the birthplace of that infamous imposter, the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith, a dubious honor Sharon would relinquish willingly to another town. I find that very interesting. That town did not want to be known for the birth of Joseph Smith, but they were and they always will be, and I'm sure it's mostly LDS tourists that visit there. On page three, it tells us the story of Joseph Smith's grandfather and how he would ride around and tell his stories of his life and say that someday he was going to write them down in a memoir. And he did. And it says in later years, Lucy could read the book successively, successively to each of her nine children, pointing to it as proof that the Mac blood was something more than common stuff. And the mantle of authorship was to rest not only upon Solomon, the grandfather, but upon Lucy and upon her son, Joseph, and in fact, upon his son and grandson, an unbroken tradition for five generations. There are so many things in Joseph Smith's family that seem to have fallen down onto him, that seem to have continued through him. And obviously, writing books was not a new or unheard of thing in his family. People talk a lot about how he was an uneducated farm boy. He could have never written the Book of Mormon. I will get to that more later in other episodes, but it's not true. And he was uneducated in the way that we think of education, but he was smart. And he came from a family with a lot of experience that would lead him to be able to write the Book of Mormon and to start a church. It also tells us that Solomon in his old age fell into a kind of senile mysticism with lights and voices around him. That sounds familiar too. It also told us about two of his uncles, his mom's brothers, Jason, Lucy's eldest brother, ran sharply counter to the religious and economic traditions of New England when he became a seeker and set up a New Brunswick quasi-communistic society of 30 indigent families whose economic and spiritual welfare, welfare he sought to direct. So his uncle started his own church, basically. He started a commune and was thought of as a seeker. Her brother Stephen seemed to have done very well for himself, and he left his money to Joseph's mom. 
We also learn in this chapter that Joseph's parents, that they weren't sure about any of the churches in the area. They weren't sure what denomination they wanted to be. And so that idea didn't start with Joseph Smith. It was already planted in him by his parents. On page five, we read that his dad would not go near any organized church until the one started by his own son, Joseph. And instead he would look to his own dreams, which he called, which his wife called visions for spiritual guidance. And Lucy especially was devoted to mysticism. Those are two points that will be very important later, especially the father's vision. But we will also see how Joseph's family practiced folk magic and was very into mysticism. This chapter also tells us about the family's money problems. We learn how Joseph Smith Sr. lost a lot of money to bad debts and he had invested in ginseng. Apparently there was a sickness going around and everybody was told that ginseng was the miracle drug and he lost all of the money. He also took out loans for other investments and lost all of those. He ended up losing all of the money that Lucy had inherited. I wanted to contrast this with the church's story. And so I looked into the book, The Saints, that they've, they've been putting out over the last few years, a few books of history. They don't mention the ginseng or what the bad luck was with his finances. They just say that he lost their money due to bad luck and unsuccessful investments. But they put more emphasis on a volcanic explosion that happened during that time period that did affect farming, which is a true story. But it makes it sound like that they were economically challenged mostly because of that as opposed to the dad's bad decisions. In this chapter, we also briefly get the story of Joseph Smith's leg surgery. When he was a young child, he had an illness that then turned into an infection in his leg. They were going to amputate, but Joseph himself and his mom both asked them not to amputate. Luckily, a doctor from Dartmouth was able to come and do the surgery to go in and chip out parts of his bone. He was very young and this would have been horrific. It would have been so painful. They didn't have ways to dull the pain except for alcohol. And so the story that's told is that he didn't take any alcohol. He wouldn't drink it. In the LDS church, this is told as a faith promoting story to remind us of the word of wisdom that we are given in the LDS church where we're not allowed to drink alcohol. And we're being shown how this prophet, even as a child, didn't drink alcohol, even for such a painful surgery. The problem with this narrative that it was even in a cartoon my kids used to watch when they were little is that the word of wisdom wasn't around yet for one thing, but Joseph Smith drank alcohol even after he created the word of wisdom. He was drinking alcohol in the gel the night before he died. And so it's kind of one of those disingenuous type of stories of look at the prophet and how he followed the word of wisdom when there's so many other examples of when he didn't and it wasn't even in existence yet during this story. But it does show us that Joseph Smith was very strong even at a young age. He was very determined and very brave. Through this chapter, Fawn Brody is really setting us up to know what background Joseph Smith was coming from, what area of the world he lived in. She talks about the different churches in the area that really are into these mystic, hyper charismatic activities and how these different churches were starting up. Most of them didn't stick around, but Joseph Smith somehow was able to make his stick. It's showing us what the world was like and how he is exactly who we would expect him to be from where he came from and the time period that he lived in. I think she does a great job of doing that. I would have loved a little bit more information on his childhood, but I just don't think we have that information. So let me know, did you read chapter one? Did you learn anything you didn't know? What are your thoughts on the points I brought up? And if you have read it, were there any other things that stuck out to you? Let me know in the comments. In the next video, I will be talking about chapter two and we will really get into this treasure digging that Joseph Smith did. It is something that people talk about in hush voices. It is something a lot of people don't believe, even though the church has backed it up and there is so much evidence for it, but it is really interesting and it is one of the things that, that cracked my faith when I learned about it. So I hope you'll come back for the next video. Thanks for watching.